Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Thank you, Jay. Great job, man. Uh, and a happy Hanukkah to you guys. So let's get together and let's do a little bit of worship. What do you say? Beth Sar Shalom, the house of the Prince of Peace. We are a messianic congregation, a community, a training ground, a learning center of Jews and non-Jews together discovering the Jewish context of the Bible, of worshiping the Jewish Messiah. Today, we are celebrating this entire week, in a week plus one day, it's Hanukkah. It is the Feast of Dedication, the Festival of Lights. And so a big Chag Sameach to you all. But as we worship together, it is my fervent wish that you find peace through the Prince of Peace.
true and righteous are all your ways, King of the ages. Who will not be the Lord? Glorify your name. Behold the Lord. God is my salvation. In Him I trust. So rejoice and be glad in this, our God is with us. Messiah, Emmanuel, Lion of Judah, lift up your voice and declare. Good morning. Please stand for the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kevod, Malhuto Le'olam Vaed. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed is the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. Amen. Please join me for the blessing before the Torah reading. Baruch Hu Adonai Hamburak. Baruch Hu Adonai Hamburak Le'olam Vahed. Baruch Hu Adonai Eloheinu melech halam, asher baharbanu mikol hamim, venatalanu et 
Torato, Barugata Adonai, no ten ha Torah. Amen. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One, forever and ever. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all peoples and has given us his Torah. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Our reading today comes from Genesis chapter 39, verses 1 through 16. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. And he made him overseer over his house and all that he owned he put in his charge. It came about that from the time he made him overseer in his house and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. So he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge. And with him there, he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. It came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph. And she said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, with me here my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he has put all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in his house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? As she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not listen to her, or lie beside her, or be with her. Now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the household was there inside. She caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me! And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. When she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled outside, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See! He has brought in a Hebrew to make fun of us. He came in to me to sleep with me, and I screamed. When he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled and went outside. So she left his garment beside her until his master came home. Wow, if that's not a cliffhanger, I don't know what is. Let's uh, go back. There's a few things that I want to point out in this passage that we can simply deconstruct. Remember who Joseph is and where he is. He is a slave in Egypt. And he, through God's blessing, is placed in a, uh, in a home, the captain of the body god of Pharaoh. Uh, and uh, he is raised up to be in a position of authority responsibility and authority. Why? Because the master, Potiphar, saw that the Lord was with him, was with Joseph, and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So even in the midst of uh, a difficult circumstance, he'd been uh, strange from his brothers, he had sold him into slavery, he is in a foreign land, and here is serving as a slave. Nonetheless, everything he touches comes out well and prospers in his hand, and he finds favor in the sight of his master. However, uh, even though the blessing of the Lord was on Joseph and on all that he touched in the household of the master of Potiphar, it does not stand to reason that all is sweetness and light from this point on. When God blesses his people, it should not 
surprise anyone, especially if one is uh, is prosperous, if one is doing well, if one's act actions are causing success, it should and reflecting quite well on the Lord, it should not surprise anyone when there is opposition from either the world, the flesh, and the devil. And certainly, uh, Mrs. Potiphar was a worldly temptation, and it's specifically the worldly temptation of her specific flesh that is the temptation, and in fact, clearly, she's got the devil in her mind, uh, and so we've got the world, the flesh, the devil, who tempting Joseph, and it would have been because circumstances and opportunity were so uh, available to Joseph. He's a young, handsome man. Opportunity was there. But he said no. And my friends, when someone propositions you and you say no, no should be no, right? We, we know that. But she doesn't take no. Mrs. Potiphar doesn't take no for an answer. And she presses him day after day after day after day, trying to wear down his noble resolve. But he does not listen to her. He will not hear it. La, 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 la. He does not want to lie down beside her or be with her, but she arranges circumstances to entrap him and make it a fait accompli, inevitable, so that she will have her way with this young servant, and nonetheless, even though she comes on strong, he pulls away from her, so much so that his clothing is... Removed. And so she left his garment beside her until his master came home. What is Joseph to do? What is a young man of God, a follower of the Lord, to do when temptation, when the world, the flesh, the devil comes against that young man? That young man stands firm. However, what we don't see in this passage, because it's in the very next passage, is Joseph having to suffer severe consequences for turning down the mistress of Potiphar, Mrs. Potiphar. You turn down Mrs. Potiphar at your own peril, the peril of Mrs. Potiphar. And he sent to a dark dungeon. Does that mean that even though he's a slave, and even though he's now a slave in the darkest of dungeons, in a foreign land, that God's blessing is no longer on Joseph? Nothing of the kind. God has his hand on Joseph because the entirety, the destiny of the people of Israel lie in the hand of Joseph. And without Joseph, there is no future for the Jewish people. How that unfolds, how that works out, many of you already know. And if you don't know, then I'm afraid you'll have to stay in suspense until you read the rest of the story. Please stand for the blessing after the Torah reading. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech Halam, Asher Notalanu Torat Emet, Vehaye Olam Nata Betocheinu, Baruch Ata Adonai, Notain HaTorah, Amen. 
Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us a Torah of truth and has planted eternal life in our midst. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. Please join me for the Ve'ahavta. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elochecha, b'chol levavacha u'v'chol nafshecha u'v'chol me'odecha. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Ve'hayu hadavarim he'ele, asher anoki mitzvecha hayom al levavecha. And these words that I command you today shall be in your heart. Vishinantam levenecha vidibarta bam. And you shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall speak of them. Beshiftacha bevetecha uvleftacha vederk uvshapacha uvkumecha. When you sit at home, and when you walk along the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. Ukshar tam laot ayedecha, vehayu la totafot bain enecha. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be for frontlets between your eyes. Uktav tam al mezuzot betecha, uvish arecha. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates.
And Hanukkah would not be Hanukkah without a good Hanukkah song. Now, this is not a worship song, but certainly a Hanukkah song. So join us, and let's have some fun with this. Hanukkah, oh, Hanukkah, come light the menorah. Let's have a party, we'll all dance a horror. Gather around the table. 
may be seated. Uh, we're going to continue our worship uh, through giving, and those of you who are at home can participate with us, and we encourage you to do so. Without your support, uh, this ministry could not continue, and uh, we uh, genuinely appreciate the generosity of, of our people here, uh, as well as those who are at home. Uh, you can go on to uh, your bank account, and you can give through Zelle, and that's a, a really great way because there's no... Uh, fees on either side of that transaction, so it's good for the giver, it's good for the recipient, and we really appreciate that. You can do that by sending it to give, G-I-V-E, at shalomdfw.org. You can also send a check to Beth Sar Shalom, 6505 West Park Boulevard, Suite 306, PMB 232, that's in Plano, Texas, 75093. Uh, you can also go to our website. Uh, and you can give there at shalomdfw.org forward slash donate. And then if you're here this morning, uh, you can participate through uh, giving in there the baskets. So uh, we do appreciate very much that you give. Father, I just want to thank you for the generosity of your people. I thank you for uh, every dollar that you've provided for this ministry to continue. And I pray, Father, you'd bless the giver over an abundant press down and overflowing. And we just ask, Lord, that every dollar would be used effectively uh, for your kingdom in such a way, Lord, that would be pleasing to you. For it's in Yeshua's mighty name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save us sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy was gone? To make you new, this child that you delivered would soon deliver you. Mary, did 
team all right now for please have a seat in the in honor of uh, of uh, discussing Hanukkah I want to uh, show you a video this was released this week and it's one of the best videos that I've ever seen that puts in a nutshell the story of Hanukkah what Hanukkah celebrates so as we dim the lights, let's bring up the video and let us watch Lighting the menorah, this video. spinning the dreidel, eating fried foods. Yep. Bring the lights down. I'm talking about the festival of lights. But there's more to Hanukkah than latkes and gelt. More than that. What if I told you that the Hanukkah story has more intrigue and violence than a season of Game of Thrones? Impossible. It's got everything. A ragtag group of rebels and zealots, a mighty empire, a civil war, and a really awful villain. So what's the real story behind Hanukkah? And why does a 2,000 year old rebellion still matter to us today? The year was sometime around 200 BCE. The place was the land of Israel, except it wasn't very Jewish at the time. The Holy Land has changed hands once or twice, or 36 times over the years. And at this particular moment, it was in the hands of the Syrian Greek Empire, AKA the Seleucids ruled by Antiochus III. The Seleucids were pretty into Hellenism, Greek culture. You know, muscular, lifelike statues, Howdy. Greek gymnasiums, Excuse me. Greek temples, Greek philosophy, Greek gods. It was basically a Percy Jackson novel. This is crazy. Hellenism had its upsides. I mean, democracy, the Olympics, a commitment to getting swole. Oh yeah! Plus, the Seleucids really encouraged their subjects to adopt Greek culture. Some Jews gave in, but others were less than thrilled about the whole polytheistic pagan thing. You don't really do that. Despite the disapproval of the anti-Hellenization crowd, life under Antiochus III was more or less peaceful. For an ancient imperialist, the guy was pretty chill. Sure, he showed up and announced that everyone in the land of Israel was now a Seleucid subject. Nice, nice. But like, he didn't kill or banish the Jews, and he didn't interfere with their right to worship as they pleased. As long as he was in charge, Jews and Seleucids were basically cool with one another. But here's the thing about monarchy. It tends to be hereditary, which means that the king isn't always the most qualified guy in the room. Antiochus III might have been great. His kid Antiochus IV, eh, not so great. Ladies and gentlemen, we have our villain, a paranoid, power-hungry, militaristic schemer. But for all his faults, Antiochus IV was politically savvy enough to exploit a power vacuum when he saw one. The Jewish priests in the Holy Temple had been squabbling for years, creating the perfect conditions for a hostile takeover. In one corner, we have the pious, non-Hellenizing types who care about the letter of Jewish law. In the other corner, we have the guys who care about power and are willing to do anything to get it. Both camps appealed to the Seleucid authorities to take their side, but it was the second camp, the I'll do anything for power guys, who ultimately won, because they made Antiochus an offer he couldn't resist. I'm talking about bribery. Bribery, nice. But here's the thing about buying your power. There's always going to be someone who outbids you. And that's exactly what happened. So when a different power-hungry weasel made Antiochus an even better offer, Antiochus accepted. Problem was, the Jews hated the new guy. Why don't you go ahead and go die? He even let Antiochus barge into the temple and cart away its treasures in order to pay for his wars with Egypt. As rumors flew that Antiochus had been killed in battle, the Jewish priests geared up for a coup. 
they were going to depose the new guy and take back what was theirs. But the rumors of Antiochus' death turned out to be just that, rumors. And when he saw the power struggles between his puppet priests, he assumed, incorrectly, that they were trying to depose him. I know, I know. Got Antiochus, not everything is about you. How dare you, Chief? How dare you? And he was so ticked off about this imagined coup that he besieged Jerusalem, massacring tens of thousands of Jews and selling others into slavery. More violence followed, but Antiochus was on a roll. Turns out, he didn't just want to kill Jews. He wanted to kill Judaism. He outlawed Shabbat, Torah study, circumcision, and kosher laws. And then, just to prove he meant business, he turned the Holy Temple into a shrine to Zeus, where he and his men sacrificed pigs, held creepy sex parties, and forced Jews to celebrate pagan holidays. The Jews were horrified, but those who spoke out were tortured and executed. It was time for drastic measures. The leader of the fight was a priest named Matatiao ben Yochanan. Yep, a priest, which means that he used to work in the temple it had some very salty words for its new management. <laughs> Matetiao had strict ideas about right and wrong. Right was Judaism. Wrong was, well, everything the Seleucids were doing. So when a Seleucid official commanded him to worship a pagan god, Matetiao killed him. And then, for good measure, he killed a fellow Jew who had obeyed the Seleucid official. Yikes. This is the part they don't tell you about in Hebrew school. The whole Jew-on-Jew -Jew violence thing. But this is actually a major part of the Hanukkah story. It wasn't just a fight between the Jews and their foreign oppressor. It was a fight between Jews about the nature of Judaism, one that had started years before as various players fought over control of the temple. Now, the fight had come to the people, and it was time to make a decision. Were they gonna buckle under foreign influences and Hellenize, or were they going to resist any attempt to change their faith? You can guess what Matityahu chose. Together with his five sons, he called the Jews to rebel against their oppressors and restore Judaism throughout the land. No, not Hellenized Judaism with its pagan influences. OG Judaism, without the altars to Zeus and the gymnasiums. Matityahu started off destroying all the symbols of Hellenism that he could find. Altars, idols, statues, buildings. When he died, his son Judah took the rebellion one step further. He was done attacking symbols of Hellenism. It was time to take on the source of the problem, the Seleucid Empire. Judah, like his father, was a true believer, so it didn't matter to him that his forces were tiny. The enemy may have had bigger numbers and better weapons, but Judah's followers had the ultimate secret weapon, their unwavering faith in God. Judah was ferocious. Friends and enemies alike called him the Maccabee, from the Aramaic word for hammer. His troops adopted the name too. Like a hammer, the Maccabee struck hard and fast. True, there weren't a lot of them, but they knew the Judean hills like the backs of their hands, so their lightning ambushes were a success. Yeah, I'll say that again. A tiny group of Jews that could have doubled as a bar mitzvah band, seriously, Judah and the Maccabees? Amazing band name. Was winning against the generals of the second most powerful army in the world. But the second most powerful army was in trouble. The Seleucid Empire was in freefall, and the first most powerful army had a vested interest in seeing them destroyed. See, the Maccabees weren't just warriors, they were also masters of statecraft, and they knew who the real power was, Rome. So they sent representatives to, shall we say, reach an understanding with the Roman Empire. The Maccabees still did the bulk of the fighting, but it helped that they had the world's biggest superpower on their side. They also had a pretty good grasp on military strategy. So when Antiochus sent a massive force led by his top generals, the Maccabees prepared a little surprise. Judah knew the Seleucids were planning to ambush the Maccabee camp. So he snuck his army away in the middle of the night, leaving all the lights burning to trick the Seleucids. But only a tiny force remained in the camp, armed to the teeth and ready to fight while most of the army was preparing for a counterstrike. Or rather, multiple counterstrikes. The Maccabees divided themselves into separate forces, using each to attack the enemy from different sides. The Seleucids were surrounded, their forces crushed. It didn't take long for the Maccabees to retake the temple, where they did a serious deep clean and built a new altar for kosher sacrifices. Finally, they lit the famous menorah with the last reserves of olive oil that remained. You know this story. There was so little pure olive oil left that the menorah was only supposed to burn for one day. Instead, it burned for eight, giving the Maccabees enough time to make more oil. 
This is why Hanukkah lasts for eight days. Eight crazy nights. <laughs> why we eat delicious fried foods. It looks like they're deep frying everything. And I'll have a Diet Coke, deep fried. Why we light Hanukkah. Absolutely, you'll, you'll light it up. Our modern tribute to the ancient menorah. So, happy ending. No loose ends, right? Not exactly. Retaking a city is a lot of work. The Maccabees may have rededicated the temple, but there was still fighting to be done. In fact, Judah was killed trying to take the rest of Jerusalem. Poe went out for the OG Maccabee. It took years until the Jews managed to kick out the Seleucids entirely. And the story doesn't end there. Remember, this was a war on two fronts, Maccabees versus Seleucids and Maccabees versus Hellenizers. The Maccabees were winning for now. They gave the Hellenizers three options. One, stop being Hellenizers. Two, leave Judea. Three, die. Some went with option one, some with option two. I'm guessing very few chose option three. The Maccabees won this round, but they didn't exactly get a happy ending. They threw off the Seleucids and established a monarchy, but their reign was marked by constant and intense power struggles. And you know who loves exploiting power struggles? Big empires like Rome. But that's a story for another time, kids. I think we would have stopped now. So Hanukkah isn't a simple holiday. It commemorates some pretty tragic stuff. Petty power struggles, religious oppression, civil war, an alliance with a superpower that eventually goes haywire. Now, I'm not trying to be the Grinch, or rather, the Grinch who stole Hanukkah, because at the end of the day, it's still a celebration of resilience, of beating the odds, of standing up for your beliefs. Throughout our chaotic history, the Jewish people have drawn strength from the story of the mighty warriors who fought to keep their culture alive and won. For what it's worth, I think the Maccabees themselves would have been both amazed and horrified by their legacy. On the one hand, Jews use Maccabee as a synonym for strength, heroism, and bravery. Israeli sports teams are named for the Maccabees, and so are the Jewish Olympics, or Maccabiah Games. And no, the irony of that isn't lost on me. But how would the Maccabees feel if they knew that their holiday has become commercialized in an attempt to compete with Christmas? So while I don't live my life like a religious zealot circa 167 BCE, I do try to spend the eight days of this holiday celebrating my right to worship freely, as I please, in my own homeland. Considering Jewish history, that's a real miracle. All right. Let's, uh, let's bring the children up for a blessing. Hey guys. Okay, kids, who can tell me what this is that I'm holding in my hand? Yes. It's a menorah, a Hanukkah, that's right, a special Hanukkah menorah. And uh, why do I have it in my hand right now? Because it's Hanukkah. Hanukkah, exactly right. And every night, as you know, you always light the middle one. And the middle one, from the middle one, then we go from one, and then the second night, it's two, and then three, and four. Does anybody know which night tonight is? No, it's three. Yes, exactly right. And on the third day of Hanukkah, what did my true love give to me? <laughs> no, that's a joke. <laughs> well... This is a very important holiday, and the prayer that I'm going to pray for you is that you guys, a little bit different than normally uh, we do, but I want, I'm going to pray this morning that you guys have the courage and the strength of the Maccabees so that if anybody tries to put out the light of your faith, or your ability to talk about your faith, or to live your faith, that you will have the courage to be able to tell them, no, that's wrong. I'm going to, I'm going to follow the Lord, and I'm going to let my light shine, right? And so Hanukkah is a time to remind us to let our light shine before all the world. This is, this is an electric menorah with batteries, because we have a cat, and the cat always wants to play with the fire, and so <laughs> we do this for right now. All right, let's pray. Our Father and our God, 
we come before you this morning grateful to be able to celebrate Hanukkah and uh, to remember what Hanukkah stands for. But help us, Lord, to, uh, to live in the light of your love and to have the courage of the Maccabees in standing up for you and being able to have the courage to be and the bravery to be able to speak up for our faith. And if people tell us that we can't worship you or that it's wrong to worship you, they can say, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. God tells us that we have to let our light shine before men so that they may see the love shining through us, the light of our God shining through us, and they may glorify you. Um, so I pray, Lord, for each one of these kids today. I pray, Lord, and for their families. Help them to, uh, to live and to grow in light of your love, your power. Uh, raise up warriors, Lord, brave and courageous to stand for their faith and to represent their Messiah um, wherever they go. And uh, we ask in the name of our Messiah, Yeshua, amen. All right, guys, you are dismissed. As to the rest of you lot, um, talk amongst yourselves. Meet and greet one another. All right, go ahead and have a seat. We're going to have our announcements. By the way, I have the uh, I have this battery-operated menorah, and I have it lit on every candle. Uh, not because I don't know which day of Hanukkah it is, but because uh, technically you're not supposed to light them during the day anyway. Uh, but uh, I see so many other holiday lights that are up that I can't uh, help myself but let my light shine. So uh, let's remind ourselves that, uh, uh, that in the spirit of Hanukkah, let us be not just for the children, but for us, facing all manner of opposition to our faith, just as the Maccabees did then, we will stand strong in our faith, no matter the persecution that comes against us. All right, announcements. Uh, wrapping up this class. You don't have a prayer. We've got two weeks left. So if you, uh, if you haven't been part of this class thus far, you've still got two, uh, two more chances to do it. Uh, limited engagement. So come and be part of our, our morning together next week at 9 o'clock, right upstairs, room 200, as we talk about the why and the how of prayer over the next two sessions. Um, anybody wants to help reset the stage, we could use some help with that. Uh, we have an annual meeting coming up on the 16th, that is next week. So if you are a member of our congregation, that means you have a vote. Uh, and uh, so we'll be voting budget and officers, presentation uh, of a budget and new officers, and uh, we'll be voting as well on that same day. We're just going to knock them all out one day next week. 
All right, and today we have our Mishpucha meal, so please stay. Hopefully uh, you've brought something to, uh, to uh, share with us today, and if you haven't, that's okay, because we have plenty to share. Um, so um, uh, please stick around for the Mishpucha meal. Uh, that means clan, that means family, so uh, don't, don't disappear. Uh, don't, don't feel odd if you don't have something to contribute to the family meal. It's okay. Uh, we're here for you. We've got food for you. Please stay. We want your fellowship. All right, having said that, let's get back to our series, our series Making the Case for Israel as the Jewish People's Homeland, Making the Case for Israel, the Jewish People's Homeland. We began this series with an overarching uh, uh, first segment, section, which is going to take weeks, uh, and that is exploring the biblical record. What does the biblical record say theologically and historically uh, regarding the uh, case for Israel and their right to the land? Uh, and the biblical record uh, dates from 2000 B.C., uh, the time of Abraham, all the way up through past the New Testament era, the time of the Second Roman Revolt, 135-ish A.D. So we begin the first subsection of this larger section. The biblical record has to do with covenants. That is the subsection in which we are. Now, in the sub-subsection, we have laid out what the Abrahamic covenant has to say regarding the uh, the promise that God gave the land to the Jewish people. We looked at Abraham. We looked at Isaac. We looked at Jacob. We saw the, in fact, take a look at this map. We'll be looking at it again. Uh, this, these are the boundaries of the promised land, including that, uh, that uh, uh, striped section. That's the boundaries as laid out in Genesis 15 of the promised land. We saw that the birth of Ishmael doesn't really impact the Abrahamic covenant because the Abrahamic covenant does not go through Ishmael. It goes through his son Isaac. We saw that it goes from Isaac and from Isaac it continues through not to Ishmael but to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Uh, I pointed out when Sarah died, and this was actually a big, the Bible makes a big deal of this, especially Genesis, regarding the one plot of land, even though all of the land is promised to the Jewish people in perpetuity, that at the time of the patriarchs, there actually only was one plot that actually was physically purchased uh, an actual transaction, and over and over and over again, that transaction is mentioned, and that has to do with the uh, cave of Machpelah in the plot of Mamre, where, uh, where uh, Abraham and Sarah were buried, the area of Hebron. Uh, after Abraham is buried in this area, we have Isaac and Jacob, the Abrahamic covenant continuing through Isaac and Jacob. Jacob receives the name Israel and the Abrahamic covenant, that basket, that complex of promises uh, that contain much more than just land, but we're only focusing on the land promise in this series, and we're seeing that... Uh, that uh, uh, not only Israel is uh, a recipient of the Abrahamic covenant, but the 12 tribes as well, uh, including Joseph, and that they will be taken back to the land of promise, the land of Canaan, and specifically mentioning the burial location once again, multiple times, the, the, uh, death, uh, the burial location in uh, Machpelah, which is outside of Hebron. Joseph dies. He expects when the Jewish people return to their land that they are going to take his bones up from there. Then we got to the, this is the new section we started last week. Moses 
and the Abrahamic covenant. We've only looked at Genesis up to that point. Uh, then we look at Exodus and how Moses, prior to the, uh, to the covenant at Sinai, to the Mosaic covenant, how Moses interacts with the Abrahamic covenant. And we looked at the burning bush. And uh, we've seen the Lord say, I am aware of your sufferings and I have come down to deliver the Jewish people, the people of Israel, and bring them to that promised land. That's Exodus 3. This is at the, uh, at the burning bush. And then Exodus 6, three chapters later, with Moses now back going to his people who are slaves in Egypt. We have the reiteration of God's plan and program. This is exactly what we commemorate, what we remind ourselves of with the four cups at Passover. And uh, I've established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourned. I've heard the groaning and I have remembered my covenant. What covenant? Moses is reiterating, or the Lord is reiterating to Moses, the Abrahamic covenant. So, we have these promises. I am the Lord. I will bring you out. I will deliver you. So I will, cup of sanctification, cup of deliverance. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, great judgment, cup of redemption. That is the cup, by the way, that we uh, commemorate when we participate in communion. It is that cup, the third cup, that our Lord took uh, and uh, added great significance, not just the significance of God redeeming his people from the bondage of Egyptian slavery, but for all who believe, Jew or Gentile alike, to be liberated from the bondage of our sin and be forgiven for our sins. And then we have the cup of uh, consummation in 7 and 8. I'll take you for my people, I'll be your God, you will know that I'm the Lord your God who brought you out from the burdens of the Egyptians and I will bring you to the land, this is where we left last week, two weeks ago rather, I'll bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. So, summarizing that great amount of summary we've already done thus far in five minutes. Genesis and at least the first few chapters of Exodus emphasize, reiterate, repeat over and over again. Repetition for the sake of emphasis. The connection between the Jewish people and this specific land with specific borders given. So having said that, let us move on and let's get to uh, let's continue with the idea of Moses and the Abrahamic covenant, and then we'll get to the Mosaic covenant. So even though the Mosaic covenant has already been given, what Moses argues when this is after the, burning, after the uh, golden calf, and God is really angry at his people, and Moses entreats the Lord on behalf of his people. Moses entreated the Lord as God and said, O Lord, why does your anger burn against your people, whom you brought out from the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Skipping a few. Remember, go back to the Abrahamic covenant, which is the main theme of Genesis. If you want to talk about something that is mentioned the most, what is, what's the one idea, the big idea that is mentioned over and over and over and over again? in the book of Genesis, and to this point, in the book of Exodus. It is not the sinfulness of man, it is not the break in fellowship that man's sin has made, the need for redemption. It is the relationship between God and the Jewish people. And that relationship is exemplified, is concretized, is put is clothed with overalls by the very concrete promise of a very specific land. Not just any old land, but a very specific land with borders mentioned over and over and over 
and over again. And so Moses knows this, and he argues on the basis of the Abrahamic covenant. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, that's Jacob, your servants to whom you swore by yourself, nobody bigger for God to swear by but himself. There's no other bigger power if God wants to, uh, if God wants to bring out the big guns and show, this is how committed I am. You'll see it doesn't happen very often, but when it does, you pay attention because God swore by himself. Genesis 22, Abraham a covenant, and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens, and all this land of which I have spoken I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. Now, remember that when it comes to theology, there's, there's no arguing with this, okay? From a theological perspective, it is very clear what God is promising, what he's not promising, what he is promising, what he's saying, what he's not saying. It's very, very clear. And again, repeated ad infinitum. But if you are not persuaded by a theological argument, in other words, if you don't believe in God, then it wouldn't really matter what God actually says. So I don't just argue theologically here. I argue historically. So whether or not you want to uh, posit that God is a fantastic, uh, I, by which I mean fantasy, not fantastic, woo, uh, which uh, idea, it's not an idea, it's true. Uh, but if, uh, you just want to say, okay, I, I, can't, I can't buy into the God thing. You certainly cannot ignore the historical evidence of documents that were written. Time of Moses is 3,500 years ago. 3,500 years of Jewish history of believing, understanding, having a certitude that the land of Canaan is indeed the Jewish homeland promised by their God. You may think that they're believing a fantasy, but you cannot argue with the historical fact that this has been the Jewish understanding of this land for 3,500 years. There is no other people who have this kind of understanding. There's... No precedent in history for a people believing that a land was given, a specific land with borders, was given to them by God, and believing that same thing, with that same borders, for 3,500 years. The land of which I have spoken I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it, how long? Forever. Next chapter, God who has forgiven his people, thanks to Moses' prayer, based upon the Abrahamic covenant, God says to them, depart, go up from here. You and the people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt to the land of which I swore. So now God is directing Moses to act on the basis of what Moses reminded God that he had promised. And so on the basis of the Abrahamic covenant, this is how integral the Abrahamic covenant is to Torah. This is how integral the relationship of God, his people, and their land is in Torah. You cannot divvy them up. You cannot separate them. You cannot shuffle, no matter how you shuffle it up, no matter how you sort it out. It always comes down to God, his people, and the land, as recorded in the Torah. Those are the fundamental foundations upon which the Jewish people have always stood. So depart, go, uh, go to the land in which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your descendants, I will give it. Now, that's the last time that Moses is going to 
argue, last major time, that Moses is going to argue based upon the Abrahamic covenant, a few minor places, but I don't want to belabor the point. So now we move on to see what does the Mosaic covenant, which is not given until Exodus 20 and forward in Torah, it's not given until, what does the Mosaic covenant have to say about the relationship between Jewish people and the land? Does it reiterate? Does it magnify? Does it amplify? What is the relationship between the Mosaic Covenant and the Jewish people's possession or right to the land? If we look at Leviticus, and this is not a chapter that many people read. It is a chapter, much like we will find in Deuteronomy, the end of Deuteronomy, it's a chapter of blessings and curses. And we pick it up, because I don't want to belabor an entire chapter of blessings and cursings, we'll just summarize that if you break the Mosaic Covenant, here's what's going to happen. You will perish among the nations and your enemy's land will consume you. <coughs> Uh-oh, that doesn't sound congruent with the Abrahamic Covenant. How does this work? Let's see if we can... C, 39, so that those of you who may be left, left in the land, will rot away because of their iniquity in the lands of your enemies, and also because of the iniquities of their forefathers, they will rot away with them. And they shall confess their... So, there are, while the possession, while the, the ownership of the land for the Jewish people as a corporate entity, is inviolable. You cannot shake it. You cannot break it. What you can do is, uh, is, is every generation can determine by their actions whether or not that particular generation <coughs> is worthy of enjoying possession of the land. The land is owned, but the land technically was owned by the Jewish people for the 400 years they were in Egypt as well. But they didn't enjoy the land. And so God is telling through the Mosaic Covenant that based upon obedience or disobedience to this particular covenant, which is not the Abrahamic Covenant, it's alongside the Abrahamic Covenant, based upon your obedience or disobedience to the Mosaic Covenant, you will determine whether or not you as a generation will enjoy possession of the land or whether the land will be devoid of your presence or the majority of your presence for a period of time. And your behavior will have direct repercussions not only for your specific generation, but for generations to come, your children's children. So notice there is a antidote to what happens when the Jewish people are temporarily dispossessed of enjoyment of the land that they own. God tells us in verse 40, and they shall confess, and the nations to which God has uh, driven them, and they're suffering. And they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their forefathers, generational repercussions, generational consequences, in their unfaithfulness which they committed against me and in their acting with hostility against me. You break the, Abraham, the Mosaic Covenant. In other words, if you're under the system of the Mosaic Covenant and you break it, then you're acting with hostility against the Lord. What happens is I also were acting with hostility against them to bring them in the land of their enemies. But what's going to happen is they will confess their sins. They will come to their senses. And then their uncircumcised heart becomes humbled so that they will then make amends for their iniquity. In other words, according to the Mosaic Covenant, the sign of the Abrahamic covenant, physical circumcision, 
is insufficient to determine possession of the land for any given generation. Depends on the behavior. And there will be consequences of, for generations to come regarding the acts of each generation or their ancestors. But no matter what the punishment may be, their uncircumcised heart will become hum humble and they will confess their sins. They'll make amends for their iniquity. And when that happens, I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham as well and I will remember the land. So, possession of the land, ownership, in other words, of the land is on the basis of the Abrahamic covenant. There is nothing that the Jewish people can do according to the Bible, not according to me, according to the Bible, that would violate uh, and invalidate God's guarantee of Jewish ownership right to the land. However, when we bring the Mosaic Covenant in, Mosaic Covenant is very clear that enjoyment of the land is not a guarantee. Possession, ownership of the land is. Even when you're out of the land, you still own the land. But you may not get to possess, or enjoy rather, the land based upon your relationship with the Mosaic Covenant. But when you confess your sins, when you come to your senses, God says, I will then on the basis of not the Mosaic Covenant, but on the basis of my faithful promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, on the basis of the Abrahamic Covenant, I will bring you back. I will remember the land. For the land will be abandoned by them. They will make up for its Sabbaths while it is made desolate without them. Yet in spite of this, when they are not, or when they rather, are in the land of their enemies, in other words, when there is worldwide dispersion, God will not reject them. I will not reject them. Nor will I abhor them so as to destroy. I'm going to be mad. God says, I'm going to be mad. I'm going to be a little upset. In fact, I'm going to be a lot upset. But I will never be so upset so as to wipe out my people, Israel. They are my chosen because of my relationship with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're not really chosen because they received the Mosaic Covenant. They're chosen because I chose, prior, 400 years prior to the Mosaic Covenant, I chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, really, I chose Abraham, and Isaac and Jacob are the beneficiaries of being a descendant of the guy I chose. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the 12 tribes, etc., etc. So while they're in the land of the I will not reject them. God, nor will I abhor them so as to destroy them, breaking my covenant with them. For I am the Lord their God. God will never break his covenant with them. God, no matter how the Jewish people behave, God will always be faithful to his guarantees. And I will remember them. I'll remember for them the covenant with their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nation. Now this is where the Abrahamic covenant meets the Mosaic covenant. I will remember... I brought them out. Why did I bring them out of Egypt? Because of the Abrahamic covenant. And once I brought them out of Egypt, what did I give them? The Mosaic covenant so that they could be in relationship with me. And I brought them out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations that I might be their God. I am Jehovah. I am the covenant God. Now remember what happens going now beyond Leviticus to Numbers. Remember what happened when the spies, we talked about this months ago when we did Hebrews. The 12 spies are sent by Moses. Go check out the land and give us a report. And 10 spies give a lousy report. Two spies give a good report, Joshua and Caleb. Uh, and the Jewish people say, Feh, 
we can't take the land, it's too hard, God, why did God do this? And God takes their lack of faith as rebellion, and he determines that you're going to, uh, that generation that disbelieved me, that rebelled against me, is going to drop in the wilderness, but their children will enjoy, they will own and enjoy the land based upon the Mosaic and the Abrahamic covenant. And so now in 14, God is dealing with this issue. Now if you slay this people as one man, this is Moses praying again for his people. If you slay this people as one man, the nations who have heard of your fame will say, because the Lord could not bring this people into the land which he promised them by oath. Moses remembering the Abrahamic covenant. Therefore, he slaughtered them in the wilderness. So, God obviously responds once again. This is a, good, this is a really good argument uh, to make with God. He responds to this argument uh, pretty positively on, on the regular, every time it's used. God, remember the Abrahamic covenant. And God says, yeah, okay, now that you mention it, got it, okay? So the land which he promised them by oath, that's the Abrahamic covenant. And then wrapping up Numbers 33, speak to the sons of Israel, say to them, when you cross over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, here's what you need to do. Drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you. Destroy all their figured stones, destroy all their molten images, destroy all their high places, all their idols in other words and you shall take possession of the land and live in it. For why? I have given the land to you to possess it. On the basis of the Abrahamic covenant expressed through the Mosaic covenant. This is how important, this is how essential understanding the covenants are in Torah. You will inherit the land by lot according to your families. The larger you'll give more inheritance. To the smaller, you give less inheritance. Wherever the lot falls to someone, that will be his. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants, this, I threw this in because this is very instructive. If you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land, it was true 3,500 years ago in the time of Moses, and it's true today. It's always been true. If you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come about that those whom you let remain of them will become as pricks in your eyes and as thorns in your sides, and they will trouble you in the land in which you live. That was a warning God gave the Jewish people 3,500 years ago. It was true then, it remains true now. Finally, Numbers 34. <coughs> Command, we'll get to Deuteronomy next week. Demand the sons of Israel, command rather, the sons of Israel and say to them, when you enter the land of Canaan, this is the land that shall fall to you as an inheritance. Remember, it's going to fall to them by lots. Uh, bigger ones are going to, bigger families are going to get a lot uh, and uh, smaller families are going to get small. But everybody's going to get it. But this is the land. And let me give you the borders even the land of Canaan according to the border. Last time we've had specific borders regarding the land was in Genesis 15. They were, they were specific, but there was some ambiguity as to exactly how far they went. Here's the border. Your southern sector shall extend. Your southern border shall extend. Uh, and then it, uh, so the south, I'm going to give you border. The border will turn direction to the brook of Egypt. Its termination shall be at the sea. So very specifically, south to the sea and the brook of Egypt. As for the western border, the great sea, it's Mediterranean. That is its coastline. That shall be your west border. This is your north border. Draw your borderline from the great sea. Go up to Mount Hor and then do a few things here and a few things there. And now we're going to go east for you. I'm dancing around because you know it won 15 verses. For your eastern border, you shall also draw a line from Hazar Enen to Shepham. The border shall go down and reach to the slope on the east side of the Sea of Kinneret. That's the Sea of Galilee, okay? The east side of the Sea of Galilee. And the border shall go down to the Jordan and its termination shall be at the Salt Sea. This shall be your land according to the borders all around. So, now, 
Moses commanded the sons of Israel, saying, This is the land that you have portioned by lot. Among you is possession, which the Lord has commanded to give to the nine and a half tribes. Nine and a half tribes are going to be on the west side of the Jordan. And two and a half tribes have received their possession across the Jordan on the east side, Transjordan, opposite Jericho, eastward toward the sun rising. So, this is where we're going to leave you. The same map that I showed you before. Now, the striped area, the striped area, is, uh, is what was promised ultimately by God in Genesis. What he lays out here is the green. He takes you from the green, see the green area, uh, Brook of Egypt, same border, uh, takes you to the green and takes you all the way up to the north, to, the, to Dan. But then the pink is actually... Um, what Moses is commanded. So ultimately it's a lot larger than what Israel is going to be able to take at this point, but Moses is instructed, tell him, take the green and take the pink. Notice what's in the pink, Lebanon and Syria. Um, all the way up north is Euphrates. That's part of the promised land, but it's not part of the land right now expected. Now, why didn't Israel take all of the promised land? They were unable to take all the promised land under Joshua. They simply did not do so. They did not have the ability to do so for whatever reason. Uh, and so not only is the striped area outside the green and the pink excluded, at this point, and that's fine because Moses is not commanded regarding the striped area, going all the way up to Iraq and throughout all of Jordan. Remember Moab, Edom, the, there are some areas, they're off limits to you right now. Don't hit Moab. Um, however, they could not take the pink, even though the pink is included in the boundaries here in, the, in Numbers 34, they couldn't take the pink, Lebanon and Syria at this point, but that green area is what they actually wound up taking. So if you think about that green area, and actually uh, part of that green area includes the, uh, actually right over the Sea of Galilee, uh, includes the Golan Heights, but they don't have the whole green area today, uh, and they don't, have, uh, they don't have a lot of what the green area is today. But nonetheless, the promise of God is not just what Israel has and possesses today, but is, as you can see, far more extensive. It includes a portion of Jordan. It includes Lebanon. It includes Syria. It includes the, what we call the West Bank, that's Judea, Judea and Samaria, and it includes the Gaza Strip. Does Israel have a right to the land Historically and theologically, according to Torah, according to the Abrahamic Covenant, according to the Mosaic Covenant, absolutely, next time we will look at the Land Covenant and the Davidic Covenant. The Land Covenant, the Davidic Covenant, Deuteronomy, and then we'll go to the time of David. We'll see exactly what is promised there as we make our way toward the New Covenant, which is Ultimately, what we celebrate, the ratification we celebrate, each time we take communion, we'll be talking about the new covenant. The land is involved in the new covenant as well. So again, from a historical point of view, from a theological point of view, Israel most assuredly has a very clear, indisputable, undisputable right to their land. We'll talk about more covenants next time, but for right now, let's stand for the Aaronic benediction. When the service ends, we'll make our way out to our Mishpucha meal, and please stay. Right? If you're a first-time visitor, uh, we'll take it by faith that you're Mishpucha. You're part of our clan. Welcome home, by the way. Um, but while most of you are doing that, I know that some of you have prayer requests. 
that you'd like prayer for. You have a need, you have a praise, you have a petition, you have a desire, you have an illness, you have a challenge, and you'd like someone to pray for you. I'll be right here in the front as soon as the service is over. You just come right down. Don't go, there'll be, there'll be food waiting for you. Okay. Um, just come on down. And I will pray for you one at a time, as many as are here, or as few as are here. No prayer request too large, no prayer request too small. This is a praying congregation. And we will petition the Lord our God to intervene on your behalf. In the meantime, we are grateful that the children have been released from being hostages, with the exception of two, Kafir and Ariel, if they're still alive, and I'm trusting that they are, I'm praying for them. There's still 138 hostages. But Israel's army is on the move. And God has given them great favor against the enemies of Israel. And we are grateful, and we thank God but we do not give up the fight, by which I mean we do not cease praying. A little bit of success doesn't mean the conflict is over. As you can see, the conflict regarding the enemies of God and God's people is not limited to the land of Israel, but it is international in scope. You saw, many of you, I hope, saw the embarrassment of our presidents, of our finest educational institutions who could not bring it, bring themselves to condemn genocide against the Jewish people. They simply could not say the most simple thing that, yes, genocide against the Jewish people violates our code of conduct. This is our culture, this is our society. We must shine like the Maccabees did. We must shine as lights in the darkness representing God to a world that cannot see in the dark. So, anyway, let's, let's give thanks to our God the ironic benediction. Yivarechecha Adonai v'yishmarecha Yadonai panavalecha v'chunecha the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you Peace. Amen. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Chag Sameach. I'll be right down.